So we just discussed the Arrhenius equation, which is an equation that relates the rate constant to temperature. And in that equation, we have a couple of the parameters that so far has been undefined, which is the pre-exponential factor and the activation energy. In order for us to bring everything together and explain what the meaning of a lot of these parameters are, we need to understand how molecules actually react and convert themselves from reactants to products. This will require us to understand the collision theory. And then we're going to explore the concept of both activation energy and something called the steric factor, which is the fact that molecules have to be oriented correctly in order to react. So the collision theory states that for molecules to react, they're going to have to collide or hit one another. And that makes sense because if you're going to make a new molecule, you're going to have to break some bond and make new bond. Okay, so let's say in the simplest case, you have these two molecules here. One is the black molecule, the other one is the blue molecule. And for the reaction to occur, they have to form another molecule where one of the atoms that's blue now is bonded with the atom that's black. So that would be your product. And these two here are your reactant. And so unless these two molecules somehow come close together and actually hit one another, those bonds are not going to want to change. And so it's the collision of the molecules that generate enough energy to actually break the bond and then with the molecule being oriented properly can then form the new bond. And so that's the essence of collision theory. And this is a really simple idea that immediately gives us something useful about rates. Because we notice that if I have one molecule right here and then another molecule right here. Of course, the collision will depend on the frequency of those two molecules hitting one another. If I have two molecules, as shown in this picture right here, where two of these white ones would have to collide with two of the red ones, the top white particle can collide with either the bottom red particle or the top red particle. And same thing with this white one. So in total here, there's four collisions possible. And then if you have a four to two combination, there'll be eight possible collisions. I'm highlighting this because the total number of collisions is really the number of each reactant multiply with each other. So in the top one, it will be two times two. With this one, it will be four times two or two times four. It's the number of particles each reactant multiply with the number of particles in the other reactant. And of course, that just means that you're multiplying concentration of reactants. So in other words, you can say that if rate is proportional to the frequency of collision and the frequency of collision is proportional to the concentration of reactants multiply with each other, then that makes sense that rate itself is going to be proportional to the product of the reactant concentration. And that explains what we see in experiments. We see that rate is equal to K times concentration of one reactant times concentration of the other reactant. Now, we haven't talked about the other quantities here, the rate constant and the order, but at least from that basic level, we can see that the reason why our rate law is the way they are is because of this simple idea of collision among particles for a reaction to happen. There is a problem with this simple collision theory, and the problem is as follows. If you just assume that every collision gives you a product, the reaction rate would actually be way faster than what we observe. So for example, if you're looking at a collection of gas particles at one atmosphere and at 298 Kelvin, there's actually about 10 to the 27 possible collisions that could occur. If there's that many collisions, then the rate of a gas phase reaction should be at the order of about a million molar per second, which if you translate this into time, everything will happen in a fraction of a second. That's not what we observe though. What we see is the gas phase reactions actually goes at a much lower rate, more like in the order of 10 to the minus four molar per second, which is about 10 orders of magnitude slower than what we expect to happen if all the collisions are generating products. So the only conclusion then must be the part that I underline here. Only a fraction of the collisions that occur actually become products. The rest of them doesn't really do anything. They collide and return back as reactants. There's two factors that make a collision turn the reactants into a product. The first one is this concept of the activation energy. 
It turns out that when you collide, it's not enough that you hit one another, but the collision has to be energetic enough. Because again, the reactants have bonds that need to be broken before the atoms can form product molecules. If the energy that you put in is not strong enough, it's not going to break the bond. Just as simple as that. And so we call this base level of energy that you need to overcome in order to actually convert your reactants to product as activation energy. Molecules that collide with energy greater than the activation energy for the reaction will convert into products, whereas the ones that don't have enough energy will stay as reactants. I'm now going to bring a concept from Chem 11 back here to explain the relationship between molecular thermal energy and the concept of activation energy. Hopefully you remember this plot from Chem 11. We call it the Maxwell plot. What it's showing is the distribution of molecules on the y-axis and then on the x-axis it's showing you speed or kinetic energy. And in Chem 11, our discussion here is mostly about how slow or how fast these gas particles are moving. So we say that there's typically a distribution that looks like that. And then we discuss things like root mean square velocity to calculate the average speed of these gas particles. But this is really just representing how molecules behave at a given temperature and pressure. So going back to the notes here on the left, the distribution of molecules at higher temperature is shown with the red curve. And then distribution for a lower temperature is shown with the blue curve. So that's just Saying that, hey, at higher temperature, more of my molecules are going to have higher kinetic energy, right? It's shifted to the right, whereas at lower temperature, they're going to have lower kinetic energy. That makes sense, right? They're moving at lower speed at lower temperature. They're moving at higher speed at higher temperature. Now, how does this connect to the idea of activation energy? If you shift back to the right side now, every reaction has a certain threshold energy that you have to overcome. I can draw that as a line here, and I say that is my activation energy which has the symbol Ea. Only these fraction, the one on the right side of that Ea line, are particles that have enough energy to actually convert themselves into products. Everybody else on the left side don't have enough kinetic energy to overcome the activation energy. So even though these green particles collide, they will never become product. And that is the first factor that limits reaction rate. You can't produce product until you overcome that activation energy, and that activation energy is gonna depend on your re actual reaction. Some reactions have very high activation energy, some reaction have much lower activation energy. Molecules that are able to overcome the activation energy and actually turns into product, we call them the activated complex. You can actually relate this mathematically to the Arrhenius equation. So I'm going to show this on the right. The activation energy part is shown on the exponent portion of the Arrhenius equation. This is actually a really interesting form of the equation because what it's telling you is that there's a number here on the top and it's being divided by the bottom part. This bottom part is our thermal energy. This is the average kinetic energy of the molecules right here. So if temperature is high, right, if T is high, then RT is also so high. Think about this. What is Ea over Rt? Well, it becomes smaller, right? Because it's a fraction. It's being divided by that quantity Rt. If Ea over Rt becomes smaller, what is to the negative Ea over Rt? Well, remember, this is the same as 1 over E to the Ea over Rt. If this number is small, the whole exponent will be small, but then 1 over the whole exponent is actually a big number. So this number increases. So if that number increases, well, it's proportional to the rate constant, so the rate constant will go up, which means the rate would go up. Okay, so just going back to the original idea then, if temperature increases, that results in the rate increasing as well. See how that explains our standard observation that when we increase temperature, we see that the reaction goes faster. Using the same approach, you should also be able to explain why rate decreases when temperature decreases. Now, in addition to the activation energy, there's a second factor that's important in the collision in order for you to produce product. And this is the concept of the orientation factor. This picture right here on the left is showing you how some collisions generate products and some collisions don't because the way the molecules are oriented when they collide. So let's say you have these two molecules, N2O and NO, and they need to collide such that they form the product N2 and NO2. 
And the main thing that needs to happen is that this oxygen right here needs to bond with that nitrogen, leaving these two by itself, and then the new molecule NO2. That's the collision that works right here because the N and the O is right here. So when they hit one another, that bond can form. But if the molecules are oriented this way, there is really no way that the new bond, which is the N to O bond can form because the molecule is oriented exactly backwards. So right now, if you collide this way, the oxygen and oxygen can form a bond, but they don't want to because that bond requires a lot higher energy to form. So therefore, this collision is non-productive. It will not generate product. Here's another example of a non-productive collision. The N and the other N is oriented with each other. But again, there's no need to form a nitrogen-nitrogen bond in this case. So this will not give you the product you want. So you you can see just in this simple illustration that one out of the collisions actually work out and the other two don't work out. And so this idea of the orientation factor is what is being captured by the Arrhenius equation in that quantity called the pre-exponential factor. The Arrhenius equation has this component a to negative ea over rt. And this number right here we call the pre-exponential factor. It actually is capturing that orientation factor. So now we can actually give it the more appropriate name of orientation factor because that number captures how much of the particles are actually oriented properly during the collision to generate product. And this A number is broken down into two parts. The two parts are something called the collision frequency, which is just how often do collisions happen. That was the number we talked about earlier at the top. We can estimate based on the number of particles we have how many collisions will occur. And then the second part, which is the really important part, is something called the steric factor. This is the part that tells you what is the percent of the collisions that occur actually gives you product. It really depends on the molecules that we're analyzing. Some molecules are really simple in terms of its shape and its three-dimensional structure, so a lot of the collisions are going to be productive. Some of these molecules, they're a, a more complex molecule, so you have to collide in exactly the right way before you're going to get a product. So this table right here uh, on the notes is showing you the value of the steric factor for some molecules. Molecules. H plus H goes to H2. That's about the simplest type of atom you can have, right? Hydrogen is small, it's spherical, the collision should always generate product, and in fact, the steric factor here is one, okay? But you can see as you get to more complex molecule, more bonds involved, the steric factor goes down dramatically. 2.5 times 10 to the minus 6 is the same as 2.5 out of a million. In a million collisions, only two and a half of those collisions generate product. You can see how small that probably Ability is to summarize both the activation energy and the orientation factor limit the number of productive collisions that we can have that's why the rates that we observe are not as fast as just assuming that all the molecules will generate products when they collide with each other